In this slide here, we point out that we can solve problems in different ways. Previously, we took our, um, our um, wall and we divided it up into um, horizontally by sections like here, here, and so on. But another way we can divide it up is by not just horizontally, vertically. So we can chop it up by layers, and we can do a parallelism like this, which is another pipeline parallelism. Here we have the first the mason busily laying the first layer, just a few bricks behind the second comes the second mason, and so on. As they all actually go along, and they get a pretty efficient parallel algorithm. And the only problem with this parallel algorithm is that the maximum parallelism is the number of layers. And so unless our wall is enormous, that's not so many layers. And so we will, it will take a long time, because the poor old first mason, that mason has to actually lay the first layer across the entire boundary from England, uh, chopping across England to divide it from Scotland. So that's a long distance, so that's not this is not as good a parallel algorithm because it's um, it requires a lot of synchronization between these uh, brick layers, and but most importantly, it is just not as much parallelism because it's limited by the number of layers. And so always, you should try to look at your problem, and you can usually decompose it in many different ways. You should choose the way which gives the largest parallelism. Another interesting feature of parallel computing is topologies. So that's illustrated in this slide here. So here we have Hadrian's wall again and with its, uh, with its optimal one dimensional decomposition. And we've basically taken a line and divided it up into parts. <coughs> and that's a so-called one dimensional decomposition. If we were building a house, we would use a two dimensional decomposition because houses when projected at for the walls and things are two dimensional. <coughs> so, although if we just did the outside of our house, we'd probably map that into one dimension because we wrapped the, ma the masons around the outside of the house. If we were building the inside of the house simultaneously with the outside, then we might use a two dimensional decomposition with some masons inside and some masons outside. In any case, this simple Hadrian's wall, the decomposition is one dimensional. And we can see that's illustrated by the, uh, the humans here uh, communicating with each other in a, in a neighboring fashion with everybody communicating with, uh, with their neighbor to the left or the right. So that's a classic one dimensional local decomposition. Uh, here we have the poor old four person screaming their commands. That's a called broadcast, which is the overall synchronization to all the bricklayers. Note that humans can actually do one-dimensional, two-dimensional decomposition. They're pretty flexible. Uh, they can they can process changes in topology, and the same is true of most uh, parallel computing networks. When you use Ethernet or InfiniBand, that can be effectively mimic and general topology. And the original machines that we built uh, to do parallel computing. Back 30 years ago, they used the so-called hypercube decomposition uh, network. Which particularly efficient at uh, simulating arbitrary meshes. And at those times, we were only doing problems which had mesh topologies. So you should always try to build, if you wanted to have a general purpose computer, its, net, its network must support general topologies. Here's a comment on the general speed up analysis. It points out that you can always write the speed up, S, to be the efficiency times the number of processing nodes, either masons or cores, depending on whether you're doing the human problem or the computer problem. On general principles, this efficiency is some measure of the overhead. Here for computing is the communication time over the calculation time. For the mason is the overlap uh, region divided by the, uh, the length of the wall assigned to each mason. There's some constant, which depends on the detailed analysis. And here we have some edge over area effect. For the masons with a one dimensional wall, the, the parameter d equals one, and this is one over the length of the wall. So this points out that we, here we have the 
basic time for masons to talk to each other by the basic time for a mason to lay one brick. And here we have the length of the, the <coughs> length of the wall, and this is all scaled with a constant, who actually ended up as an overlap region divided by the distance assigned to each mason. In general, um, the, um, these would be in the case of those scientific simulations, these are just number of mesh points in the problem. So if you fix the grain size and you look at um, the speed up, you will go back to this formula here. And so for fixed grain size and uh, for a given computer of which this ratio is fixed, you will find the efficiency is constant. So the speed up is actually a straight line. So this is a so-called scale speed up or weak scaling. If you fix the problem size and you look at the speed up as a function of number of nodes, then the grain size grows like one over the number of nodes. And so the grain size gets smaller. The grain size is at the bottom of the formula for efficiency, so the efficiency goes down. Because if you have more nodes on a fixed problem size, as you increase the number of nodes, the amount of work per node goes down, and the overheads, the ratio of overhead to work done by the node goes up. And so you get this level, this uh, leveling off of the speed up. And all problems are characterized by this, what the number of nodes here is, and that different for different problems. How long you can actually, how many, you want to try to run in this region here, somewhere in this region here, because that's when you're getting efficiency. If you run after this thing is tailed over a lot, then you're gonna, that's not such a good, good idea. This points out that um, if we look at nature, uh, whether if we look at the brain, it's a bunch of um, um, neurons sending messages and by ex using axons and dendrites, so it's using message passing. If we go to our favorite cloud computing, those computers are also communicating by messages. If we look at actually society, society is um, people, those people are talking to each other or, or um, and so they're a collection of brains, and they're actually sending messages. These messages are done by, well, in this particular case here, we're doing it by uh, recording a video. So that's again by sending a message. This video is a message which I'm sending to you. If we take an ant hill, we uh, they actually use chemical signals and drop them on the ground to send messages. So nature's computers use message passing, and they do that with several different architectures.